Good afternoon and uh, good evening uh, to everybody. Welcome to this uh, STARS webinar. I'm Tony Schoenenberger. I'm the co-founder and executive chairman of STARS. STARS webinar actually are interactive discussions about future-oriented topics such as uh, geopolitics, technology, climate change, health, and uh, leadership. A select group of people is attending this webinar live, and many more watch STARS webinars later on as a recording. Today, we have the great privilege to talk to uh, Tan Chong Men. So good morning, or actually it's good afternoon, uh, Chong Men. Great to have you on this uh, webinar. Thank you very much Thanks. for joining. And thank you for having me and good morning. Uh, John Meng is the group CEO of PSA. PSA's global network uh, encompasses more than 60 deep sea rail and inland terminals in 26 countries all over the world. John Meng also serves on various boards of which I should mention the co-chair of the Emerging Stronger Task Force to guide Singapore's economic recovery from COVID-19. Before joining PSA, Chong Meng held top, held top positions at uh, Shell. Now we have more, uh, approximately 30 minutes to discuss uh, a few questions uh, with uh, Chong Meng. I will take the privilege uh, to ask uh, the first couple of questions. If you have uh, any questions for Chong Meng, please use the Q&A feature below to type in your questions. So let's go right into uh, media's race. Chong Meng, obviously the, the first question would be after uh, the uh, pandemic, or we are right in the middle of the pandemic actually, what are the, let's say, the three major challenges uh, for PSA? Well, firstly, uh, Tony, thank you for the invitation again and uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar and the opportunity to share with you my thoughts. Now, challenges uh, for uh, PSA, I think, reflect the challenges for the supply chain industry. We can't open a newspaper without reading about the problems of supply chain and how you might not get your Christmas gifts if you haven't ordered it yet. Uh, but I think it's important to unpack a little bit, actually, where is the problem, what caused it, and how we might recover from it. Uh, and that's the short-term problem. And then, of course, there is the next, you, know, you asked for three major challenges. Uh, the next major one will be when we recover, meaning into the medium and the longer term, are we still trying to solve the same problem? Or do we have other problems to solve? And I'll get to that. Uh, so maybe to unpack it, I thought it's useful to go through a bit of information. Uh, I have uh, Stella standing by to help me toss up a few slides very quickly, just data to get us all aligned. Now, this is the quarterly growth, uh, GDP growth of G20. And we all know that it was a deep uh, drop, step down in Q2 last year. And there was speculation whether it'll be a V, uh, sort of a, a long U recovery or, you know, all sorts of scenarios, but the world has shown to be quite resilient. And why? Because even though travel and mobility related services had to close down, the world had an appetite to consume. You can't travel, money is put in your pockets, you buy stuff and it's still possible to consume online. So next slide. And one thing about the consumption is that it is quite extraordinary against the backdrop of a long-term trend of declining share of spend, yeah, goods consumption, being on a downward trend relative to services. It is something that started decades ago. It's the last two years that broke out from that trend. And next slide. In regression analysis, you'll see that it's actually quite a distinct departure. So how will it step back? Will it get back to the long-term trend? How significant is this? Next slide. It's actually something like about 10% in terms of uh, value of uh, uh, spend shifted to goods. But in terms of trade and in terms of volume, 
in the later half of last year and the early part of this year, there was a spike of getting up to at least 20 to 30% normal. That was the demand. Of course, it was not easily met. All right, next slide. As you can see, it translated to port handling of a very quick recovery, about 15% even. And this is just a quarterly number. So if you get back to the monthly, the spikes can be even uh, more uneven and, and, and as a result, uh, cause a problem to the smoothness of operations. Next slide. The volumetrically, on an absolute basis, is not really that scary. We have coped with this type of growth before, just not the unevenness. So what it says is that supply chain has the capacity in normal times to handle this type of volume. But then what is abnormal? When you go to the next slide. What is abnormal is that while ports are still active and open, the connection of the ports to the hinterland, the truck drivers, the intermodal uh, activities moving the box from say sea to rail and to other junctions have been affected. And the connectivity aspect has been affected. Uh, and here you see how vessels bear the brunt of it. Because if connectivity is affected and things are not flowing, the ports will become very full. They cannot evacuate. Vessels struggle to come in. And vessels then are late for the next port of arrival. And this is just Singapore data. We are a hub that receives many ships in the world. And you see that vessels are arriving off performa. Typically, there's about 50% of vessels that arrive late. And over the last few quarters, it's a much higher number. And not only that, they don't just arrive late, but they arrive very late. And the highest number that we saw in Q3 recently is something like about six to seven days late. And so you can see, so we get off the slides now, and you can see that it's actually business unusual. What we've had to do in the short term is to support our shipping lines to connect better, connect faster. And we have gone one step further. Tony, as you recall, during the time that we've been partnering on this series, PSA has shifted from ports to inland services to digital services. Now, fortunately, with the digital services, we've been able to acquire data from our various nodes of operation. Today, through our cargo system called Callista, we actually offer this information for free. So we help people with digital information. We help people with advisory. So people who have cross-border issues uh, can uh, reach out to us. Uh, Multi-modal challenges. Uh, we also provide financial services, straight finance, compliance services. And in time to come, we'll also provide sustainability services. So actually, this whole disruption has accelerated the impetus of our team uh, to provide this type of ser uh, services faster and make them available uh, uh, more conveniently to our customers. And we are, have the opportunity to reinvent our platform uh, in terms of user experience and so on. In the medium term, we find that uh, manufacturers are concerned about how to move from just in time to just in case, and then reshoring, shortening supply chain, and what is the right way to navigate uh, potential trade measures, cross-border carbon tax mechanisms, what is the right way to serve? And then with manufacturing IR 4.0, opportunity of 3D printing, uh, do we need everything? And the product itself is also being redesigned. ICE to EV, and of course, cars are components are something that we ship quite a lot. So all these are changing and they, they, they will require supply chain partners to advise, to rewire, to remap. We are positioning ourselves for that. That is a significant challenge. It's going to be uh, sooner than you think yeah, because people are thinking about how to invest. Uh, the purchase of capital goods is going up. People thinking about how to build the next factories and the next infrastructure. Then the third one is preparing ourselves for uh, what to be, uh, what it takes to be a green supply chain partner to supply chain users. There's a lot more I can say on that. Uh, if there's a question on that, I'll go further. But that's something that we're doing as well. Thank you very much. What uh, can be, or can you, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit on the uh, key technology trends uh, you are expecting over the next five to ten years? Oh, um, Say so over the last five years, 
one of the key tech trends is digital and IoT. Now, uh, in the digital transformation that we have seen over, say, a couple of decades, create for us now uh, a digital economy, we've seen that digital is adopted a lot more quickly in areas that are, say, purely digital to digital fulfillment. So if the production is digital, like games, and the consumption is digital, like, uh, say, uh, even uh, uh, gaming systems, gaming leagues, uh, it's a lot quicker. Finance, a lot quicker. But where it requires physical digital convergence, or some even say uh, digital, right? Digi physical. It, it requires the IoT to be more mature, data and integration and collection uh, to be more robust, data structures and standards to, be, to allow more connectivity, exchange to be enabled. And as a result, then you get reliability and you get knowledge. Reliability for process, knowledge for change. This is not happening yet across the space in supply chain, which is multiplayer, fairly fragmented. So I think even though it started years before, there's still some space to go. And then we can bring on board the more sophisticated machinery that allows us to automate, that allows us to use, say, different types of energy, reconfigure our operations, change our process, rewire, and become more sustainable. So that part of using engineering in a different way, in a smarter way, with 5G, with things that allow you to optimize, uh, that will be a necessary revolution. Sometimes it may be to do the same thing that we did before, but hopefully do it without injuring the planet. Does that mean that in the end, in uh, a couple of years, you need less people? Because the more technology you have, the more robotics actually you have, the less people in the end, so that the port is uh, fully automated? Well, if you compare, say, uh, 1990 with 2040, you will indeed see a different, quite a different uh, scene comparing between the two. But if you were to just take it through the transition, you will then realize that you cannot flip the page and say, suddenly I need less people. I don't think any country or any enterprise uh, truly works like that, right? So in the port scene, we have the first generation port in Tanjung Paga, which is still very labor intensive, and that will close in 2027. Uh, I'm sitting outside our second and third generation port, Pasir Panjang, you visited it before, and that's less labor intensive, uh, but it will continue to operate until 2040. And we will start our new Tuas terminal, uh, in fact, in the coming month, continue to grow that until 2040 and that will have a lower labor ratio. But if you take the whole organization as uh, in its entirety, while the total labor number doesn't change that much, we enjoy labor productivity. So we don't need less people, but we need, we need less people to move a single box. So you get productivity. And because of the hybrid or the multiple types of operations, uh, we actually will stay with pretty much the same number of people overall. The mix will change uh, and, and become more complex. You must grow, otherwise you have an issue. Opening the, uh, the floor, I just have a, um, a last question to you regarding climate change. Uh, you know, we hear or we are hearing a lot about Arctic or Nordic uh, shipping using the North uh, routes. What uh, impact would that have on uh, Singapore, on, on your business actually? So climate change will cause quite a number of things in a more um, sort of uh, gen generic aspects that will affect the port operations. It's a concern about rising sea levels. It's not something limited to a particular spot or a particular trade route. It can affect our whole portfolio. 
And so we have to start to consider those kind of realities. Uh, the Arctic route is one particular aspect of the whole suite of issues that could arise uh, if climate change were to accelerate or keep its current pace. Previously, we had uh, considered that it will be maybe a couple of decades out. The shipping lines are still not convinced. Uh, for our business, to be frank, Tony, which serves cargo movement between production and consumption, but going through trade routes that have multiple pickups and drop-offs, just like a bus service, it is more um, it is more appropriate to use a trade route like the Straits of Malacca and the East-West route because there are many production centers and so consumption centers, and you get in a single route pickups and drop-offs, hence a lot more revenue than say the Arctic route, which passes an area which is much less economically vibrant in terms of production and consumption. But resource, which is express service, yeah, whether it's energy resource or mineral resource, uh, can use that as a shortcut, but your shipping costs are gonna be higher and limited to windows of the year under such time that indeed uh, the Arctic route may be open for longer in the year in which case, then we better worry about a lot of other things. <laughs> we have uh, a couple of questions. First one by Stefan Schreckenberg is from uh, 3 3 How do you intend to develop your risk management in light of those changes as new or more severe impacts could occur in an old digital world? Thanks for the question, Stefan. Uh, even before moving into, say, uh, a, a more digital exposed, digitally exposed world, uh, our business do have a number of big risk buckets. Uh, when you operate across so many countries uh, with different jurisdictions and different stability uh, in terms of law governance and practices, uh, you will learn enough to develop a risk assessment system that is both bottom up, top down, and it's our enterprise management, risk management system. And what we had to do and, 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 and define it in buckets. So there's business, there's operational risk, there's commercial and uh, country risk and so on. And what we've had to do recently was to evaluate our cyber risk as a very specific category of risk and subject it to a high level scrutiny. And that then forces us to keep on a cycle of ever improving defense uh, against uh, cyber risk. It's not difficult, uh, not easy to ensure at the moment. And so we have to be very good. The other thing of course is in a port environment, in Singapore itself and in other places, uh, the idea of port being a critical infrastructure is something that uh, government has expressed quite clearly. And so we have to have uh, the uh, right defense and the right recovery procedures, and data management, and so on, uh, to fit the requirements. I hope that answers the question. Uh, but then if you talk about the business implications that when you go digital, you could be disintermediated. Uh, you could see cross industry, uh, integration that could say disintermediate you. Now, all those are other risks that we could talk about for a long time. Yeah. We have uh, another question by uh, Tobias Huber from Siemens. Could you please elaborate a bit on first, how to become a green supply chain partner offering sustainability services? And secondly, how you define and achieve PSA International Sustainability ESG targets? Okay, uh, thank you, Tobias. I hope I got the name right, Tobias. Um, yes, yes. Okay, supply chain partner. Now, the first thing, of course, is make sure that we ourselves do a good job and uh, we emit about uh, 1.1 million tons a year our scope one and scope two emissions. So our emissions in our perimeter and the emissions of energy companies who supply the electricity to us combined is about 1.1 million, million tons. And we have an ambition of uh, 
reducing that by 50%. This is the 2019 baseline. Uh, by uh, and achieve that by 2030, and then be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, today, the port is already shifting its primary energy use. Uh, for a long time, we were diesel fuel dependent for our cranes and our horizontal transport equipment, prime movers and so on. But we're increasingly electric, electrifying that and rely on the confidence that our grid in our various countries will get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Now, of course, that is a question, not a certainty. Uh, we do our part in producing renewable energy ourselves as far as possible. If not, then we procure renewable energy. So we're trying to reduce scope one and scope two. Uh, within our scope and within the pace at which we can do that, we find that indeed it's still challenging to meet those targets. So we will want to work with other partners to see whether we can create carbon mitigation that is that, 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 we, that can associate with our uh, scope of business. So not using offsets like nature-based solutions, but supply chain mitigations that have carbon mitigations that will be something that we can claim that <laughs> we played a role to create such a carbon reduction. Optimization, basically, in the short term. In the medium, longer term, we will want to use new energy and we also want to be the vehicle or the channel that provides the new energy to the people who need it, for instance, the shipping lines. But I find that there is a, a, a lot of opportunity under, under tapped, untapped, but not untapped, but under tapped in optimization. It's, it's simply like before we question whether our grid is uh, clean enough, let's change the light bulb. Let's use LED. Because then the pain of moving from an the former energy to or the current energy to the next new energy is even less when your intensity is lower. In supply chain, there's a lot of examples where we can change the light bulb to LED. But that requires convergence, that requires an ecosystem. And as PSA, we're trying to uh, work with partners to bring together solutions. Uh, they are actually in our website, in, in our PSA website, you can go through that. Uh, but we believe there's more opportunity there. We also think that we can play a role in helping to <clears throat> uh, set up good carbon measurement, carbon verification, carbon accounting, and carbon exchange uh, types of mechanisms that will allow more people to participate. So we may be the solution provider, but the consumer of the outcome may not be the direct freight buyer, green freight buyer, maybe somebody else, it can be more inclusive. Uh, so we are interested in bending the science, changing the science part, science-based part, but we're also interested in making it commercially more accessible. So that's what we're trying to do. The other thing about um, <clears throat> the second question is that how, how do you define achieving PSA sustainability and ESG targets? Just on the E part I mentioned just now, those are our targets. Uh, I hope that in time, we would have some terminals that are really showcasing not just being carbon neutral, but even carbon negative. And for that, we'll have to experiment with power production. And I believe it's possible. If we can become first green freight produ producers ourselves and encourage ecosystem to come together to optimize and then use that green energy, uh, it can be quite interesting. Uh, the SNG, I think, uh, equally important because it's not a journey that uh, can be done just by commerce alone. It has to be inclusive. We have to consider what it takes to be responsible, maintain our license to operate. So we actually published all this in our first ESG uh, report uh, just two months ago. And welcome you to go have a look at it. We're running out of time already, uh, Tong Men. May I kindly ask to um, uh, shorten your answers a little bit because uh, I would like right. to uh, ask uh, uh, another question or a few questions actually. Next one uh, related to the very, uh, the last one, Andreas Kemp uh, from Carl Zeiss. He's a Stars alumnus. How do you generate 
compile and provide information on ESG along the supply chain as service for your customer. Uh, thank you, Andreas. So I'll keep it short. We have a cargo platform called Callista, which supports people on freight management, on trade compliance, and on trade finance. And it is, it is through this system that we engage with the buyers of freight. In time, we will develop carbon calculators, which is funded, uh, which is fielded with in, uh, resource uh, information from our actual operations, as well as from uh, data sources that provide this type of verified carbon data. We will use what we can, but the system is highly immature at the moment. And uh, we believe that it will take some time uh, before the information is more stable and more consistent. But that's what we're trying to do to push um, uh, better awareness as well as better use to create better discipline in uh, carbon-related re carbon accounting. Question from Alan Jensen. He's the chairman of the Malaysian uh, Danish Business Council in uh, Cayenne. Will hydrogen or ammonia be a viable bunker alternative in the medium to long term? And are you actively planning facilities for storage and distribution? Uh, the short answer is we are not yet planning facilities for storage and distri distribution at scale. We are considering them on, say, experimental basis, what it will mean for port-related facilities. Uh, but coming back to the first part of the question is, will H2 or NH3 be viable bunker alternative? <clears throat> uh, I would say that there are medias, me, there are vectors or mediums for converting and transferring the uh, energy package from a renewable source to the vehicle who needs the right type of fuel because they have a relatively hard to abate set of operations. And that is a ship or we can also consider the airplane as being uh, a candidate for using such kind of resources, including bio. The challenge is not the vector itself. The challenge is the availability of the renewable energy, which is the primary energy source from which you get uh, hopefully green hydrogen, green ammonia. Uh, because you can get blue, of course, in either case, but blue is not exactly green, is it? So I think we have to solve that and the facilities and infrastructure uh, can be more easily set up. Although I would say the cost part of it should not be underestimated. You are the co-chair of the government committee to guide the Singapore's economic recovery from COVID-19. Can you please tell us what are the major lessons learned for Singapore as a whole and for PSA in particular? For Singapore as a whole, I think uh, one, better collaboration between private and public. COVID is a... Uh, is everybody's problem. You can't solve it by policy only. You have to have innovation, both in terms of policy as well as in terms of the response. And private sector is often faster, operate in a different way. But the way to engage the private sector is to allow action before policy. So you have to allow some wriggle room on policy space and say, go experiment. And then after that, backfill the policy. In the EST work, we try to do a bit of that through this mechanism called the Alliance for Action. So like online, offline, retail, coming together and experimenting with facilities, with procedures, with methods that allow people to be able to conduct business during the pandemic, expand to other markets during the pandemic. We take the same approach to deploying robotics, to uh, encouraging safe travel, to how we buy, how we sell, how we trade, how we deliver, how we even construct the built environment, and how we also look at playing a role in the exchange mechanisms for uh, future sustainable products like nature-based solutions. So, uh, short answer, first thing we learn is how we can collaborate better. Secondly, while you're developing strategy through careful analysis, encourage action taking. 
and then let them come and converge into a more informed uh, implementation based set of regulations. Yeah, I think that is, a, that is the centerpiece of the ESD. Because in the past, I mean, the, the, the way in which policy making, we all know is frankly pretty good. But through all this, we say that um, the crisis has taught us perhaps in the future, our modus operandi uh, can be tweaked so that we practice how to always use private resource in this uh, government policy making and act faster. Last question, uh, Chong Meng. Uh, I've known you uh, for a couple of years and uh, I do know that you're an outstanding business leader. So therefore, a question on leadership. First, how to grow the next generation of leaders in your company? Second question comes after. <laughs> well, firstly, the next generation of leaders, Tony, they're younger than us. <laughs> I'm older than you, I think. The millennials are now becoming managers. Last time we talked about them like they're kids, but now they have become adult career people, if I call them that, right? Uh, for millennials, change is an ally. Previous generation, well, a bit unsure whether change is a friend or a foe, but millennials love change. Work-life balance is important. Career is not about job, but about experience and enrichment. So we, if we want to develop leaders out of that set, I think we have to also ensure that the environment is conducive to allowing them to be empowered and uh, to be groomed. And, and so space is needed. But for the next leaders, I would say uh, digital literacy is key. Very hard for leaders to thrive in a, our kind of business uh, system enabled and systems will become more complex in general. Right, digital literacy, and because of millennials and the diversity that we will have with with automation, with digitalization, uh, the port used to be more male oriented. We are much more gender balanced now. Inclusiveness, the need to inspire rather than direct, and being the multi dimensional leader because of complex systems, and those are important attributes I believe to lead uh, with a strong focus on developing millennials. A very fine question and a very concrete question. You know, if you look for a new direct report for you, of yours, what skills do you look for? So I kind of preempted it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think um, comfort with uh, being part of a digitally enabled company enterprise where you are always agile thinking of uh, innovative processes, but using knowledge. Uh, if, if you have executives who are comfortable with being managers, implementing faithfully the processes that are designed over many years, that's not the direct report you want. Uh, you want a direct report who questions it, who tells you this is the reason why I question it. These are the people that I have consulted, have included and have understood. Uh, in terms of the demands or their expectations. And that's how I came up with this idea. And uh, also able to connect the dots very simply uh, so that people know what they're doing and yet uh, feel compelled that it is the right thing to do. Uh, just sustainability. I mean, how to decomplex that topic. Uh, your next leaders should be able to be short-term delivery focus, long-term goal, um, driven in a simple way to show how you can stepwise achieve those goals. Yeah. This is actually an excellent advice for all the uh, ESA uh, staff members uh, listening to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, John, we have to come to an end. Uh, the 30 minutes uh, are up. First, uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for these uh, brilliant insights and analysis, analysis of an uh, ever more complex world. I think we all benefited uh, an awful lot. At the same time, I wish you, uh, John Men and PSA, uh, all the best and every success. And again, you mentioned it. Uh, I very much look forward to uh, seeing you again, hopefully in June of next year, during the uh, next uh, STAR Symposium in uh, Singapore. Secondly, the next STARS webinar will be with uh, Marie Astrid Langer. 
She is the NZZ correspondent in California. And she just wrote uh, a book on uh, Kamala Harris. And the title or the topic of the next webinar would be America's first female vice president and president question mark. So we will talk about geopolitics, about the US, and of course about uh, Kamala Harris. I hope to see you there. In the meantime, take care, stay healthy. Thank you very much and goodbye.